Good morning. Today is June 13th, 2024. This is the time set for oral argument in case number CACV 230454, Phoenix Law Enforcement Association et al. versus City of Phoenix. Out of respect for counsel and to avoid any embarrassment for anyone in attendance in the courtroom, please make sure your cell phone is on silent. Each side is allocated 20 minutes for oral argument, although you are not required to use all your time. It's my understanding that appellants, uh, Phoenix Law Enforcement Association and the Clark parties will be splitting time. Um, if either appellant wishes to reserve a portion of that time for rebuttal, you are free to do so, but it is your responsibility to keep track of that um, time at the podium. The clock on the podium reflects your total remaining minutes. Please keep in mind that we have read the brief, studied the record, and discussed the case in conference. Please keep that in mind as you present your case. You may proceed. Good morning, your honors, and may it please the court. My name is Eric Wilson, and I am appearing on behalf of the appellants, the Phoenix Law Enforcement Association, as well as the certified class of 487 uh, police officers who have elected to participate in the wage enhancement provisions that we're here to discuss today, at least as of June 20, uh, 2014. I'd like to try to reserve three, uh, three minutes for rebuttal if I can, and if time permits. But the record in this case is extensive and many of the arguments on appeal have been addressed uh, several times over, in fact, by the lower court. But now, uh, in the short time that I have before you today, um, I ask the court to, con to consider two main points to indicate that the Superior Court erred in granting the city's uh, uh, summary judgment. Uh, first, that the Superior Court failed to conduct a meaningful and holistic analysis of the MOU language and the evidence of the intent behind the wage enhancement provisions. Second, that the Superior Court's ruling made unreasonable inferences, leaps even, if you will, as to the intent and misapplied the substantive law, namely Leighton, uh, M&G Polymers, Tackett, and Godby. Um, as to the contract. Okay, so when you say the court didn't do a holistic review, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Can you be specific? Yes. Um, essentially looking at all the contracts provisions, specifically the wage enhancement provisions, as well as the expirational clauses. It seemed to me that the court sort of halted once the expiration clause was considered without further reviewing uh, what Leighton and, and Tackett would ask uh, the court to do. Uh, the, the durational language um, that the court sort of halted on seemed to me, uh, excuse me, I'm... It seemed odd that a contract would end, but there would be provisions that would continue it, on. Well, normally that would be the case. When the provisions contained within that contract extend beyond, then of course we have to interpret the contract as to the intent of the parties in the plain language. In this case, Your Honor, the, the contract and obligations were very clear and unambiguous. They lasted for a three-year duration. And but that, I took it to mean that the employee could continue with the program for a longer period of time, but that doesn't mean that if the program ended that the this guarantee that, that 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 program had to continue. Th that seems to be the uh, interpretation, the contractual interpretation, um, that the, the, the Superior Court sort of conducted this flawed interpretation on. It, they stated that it merely indicates 
that the three-year duration merely in, in indicates that an employee cannot opt in and out. Uh, and they go on to say that, in other words, the three-year election language plainly defines the duration of the election rather than the duration of the benefit. That's a, sort of a confounding conclusion that the court comes to. It's not supported by the evidence, and it, it ignores the, the language of the provision that actually in, calls it an, what, a benefit. Uh, what, what evidence, counsel? What, what, what is the, the clear evidence that says you have a contract that says this is the end? Okay. So, and, and this is what the Superior Court says, right? We have a contract that says this is the end. And your argument is that the evidence and this one provision on page 34, 33 of 60 says, no, that's not the end for this one particular provision. So what evidence? Well, that, that would exa be exactly what Leighton instructs us to look at, is whether, in addition to the durational clause, there's other contexts where a benefit within that entire contract would also extend. The evidence is that the 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 parties intended it for, to be a three-year benefit. Where, where's that intent? That, in, that intent is <clears throat> uh, based on number number one, the plain language of the contract that states that it must continue for a full three consecutive years. Number two, the intent is also provided as early on in this case as almost ten years ago during the TRO hearing, where the city's uh, labor relations administrator as well as please negotiator always stated that the intent was for it to uh, be a, a pensionable compensation. Furthermore, that um, the police um, chief negotiator testified, and that's in the evidence, that it was intended to target that high three so that the officers on their 17th year of eligibility and uh, can uh, have the next three consecutive years be used for their final average salary pension calculations. So I, I'm, I'm sorry. It, um, it, help me help me understand this. The plea, it, it's clear plea would like to allow this this pension spiking to occur. And, and, and I, I think that that's the, you know, the, the question here is, I don't think anyone disagrees that, that this benefits plea and its members. The, the question that I have is, is where is the city's intent that that be the requirement? The, the city's intent the city's intent that it be the requirement was at the bargaining table, Your Honor. It was at the meeting of the minds when the parties necessarily said, we're going to put a three-year term within a two-year agreement. What about the city's intent that this contract end in 2016? And they intended to do that in order to try to uh, gain control over what seemed to be their uh, unfunded pension liability. But it goes back to the intent. Well, let, let's let's put that because that's subtext, right? What what we're talking about here is intent of the 2012 to 2014 contract. Okay, so it, and I misspoke. I didn't mean 2016. I meant 2014. I understood. Okay, so um, so I apologize. Uh, but in the 2012 to 2014 contract, where do we get the intent that the city says, "Oh, this this." contract calls it quits in 2014, but not really. Where, where's the city's intent on that? It, it, it is exactly in the terms of the, the, that, of the three wage enhancement provisions. You, you can't necessarily have a, an agreement that you know and contemplate is going to end in two years when the benefit lasts for three, and it's non-discretionary. It must continue for that officer. So, Council, I'm, I'm glad you bring up that language, the must. Yes. And, and I want to know where you're getting that from. Um, because specifically, I'm looking at Section 3-4B of the contract, Optional Uniform Allowance, and it says, the consecutive three-year period may be stopped and restarted one time for an additional three-year period up to a maximum total of six years. So where are you getting the must. Yes, Your Honor. I I'm referring specifically to the 2012-2014 MOU in Section 3-4, mm -hmm. which was titled Sick Leave Conversions at Retirement. And in Section 5, it states that a unit member who has accrued 17-14 hours or more of unused sick leave may elect to have the additional sick leave that they earn, uh, he earns paid to him as salary on a monthly basis. Here, and here's the operative language, Your Honor. Once the employee elects to exercise this benefit, 
it must continue for the full three consecutive year period. The employee may stop and start restart this benefit one time without further qualification. So that tells me that the employee must continue their election, meaning they can't jump in and out and in and out of the election. Is that not a reasonable construction of that provision? Th that would be a one, one uh, sort of a unilateral, but the, the entire consideration here is that the city continues to experience the benefit, the same benefit that it had received from the officers who elected into this program for the prior 14 years so that they might become eligible to receive this benefit. And so it, it, it not all, and that, that's, I think wait, wait, that's, wait, did, did you say this, it's the city's benefit or it's the employee's benefit? Both parties benefit from these, sir. How, Your Honor. how is the city benefiting from the this? The city benefited from this by judicious use of sick leave over 14 years, specifically in 3-4. The city benefited by um, lowering overtime costs uh, for officers who called in sick and then they didn't have to pay someone. Uh, there's there's a, a few other reasons, and I, they're not coming to mind. Uh, these were explained in the TRO hearing as to the benefit and the mutual benefit that both the city gained and the officers and the community. Okay, so let's, and, and I think, I I apologize, I've wandered a field again, because I, I don't know that that is, because uh, we're on summary judgment here, right? So. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. We're on summary judgment here, right? So. Y yes. What was so my, my question is, is it reasonable to expect a contract term? Because, I mean, it, this same term that you're, you're looking to, the, the ending is that the employee may stop and restart the benefit one time without further qualification up to a maximum total of six years. Is it your position that then they have a six-year guarantee on this? It, it's my position that if the employee continue, once they have opted, met the qualifications and elected into that program, that they're in, within the four corners of this MOU, and submitted an election form with identical pr pr uh, provisions that they then have a vested benefit to continued uh, to, to receive the continued benefits throughout this contracted period. That includes a three-year and a six-year one time without qualification. Okay, so the direct answer your, to my question is yes. Y yes, Your Honor. Okay, I'm sorry. I... It, it seems like a, a backdoor way of of making a three-year contract a six-year contract, but I'm not really sure that that's what everyone intended. I'm I'm trying to find a way to respond to that, Your Honor, by simply saying, but but, but I, you, when the parties agreed and they met in the they had a meeting of the minds and there was consideration that formed this agreement, it there's no evidence that the city and the city council did not understand that they were including a three-year benefit within a two-year contract. I, I see I've, I'm going over my co-counsel's time. I'm, I've tried to answer your questions the best I could, Your Honors. Uh, I'll reserve the rest of my time. Thank, Thank you. Council? Good morning, and may it please the court. I am Caroline Pilch, and I represent the Clark plaintiffs and the class that they represent. And I want to just jump right into some of the questions you have or that has been asked of my co-counsel here. One of them is about intent. It is our position that the Superior Court absolutely erred when it ruled that the city's contractual obligations ended with the 2012-2014 MOA. And that is because not only is there that specific language within the MOA that states once elected it must continue, it's the employee's right to opt in and out, but the city's intent is manifested in other ways too beyond this contract. It's manifested in the administrative regulations that we cited in our brief that the exact same language that they have here. It is also uh, evident, or I should say intent is evidenced through the manner in which the city has implemented and managed this program throughout the years. One of those being the written election forms that the city drew up and in order for any member to be paid 
once they met the benefits or the qualifications to be paid those benefits, they had to sign that election form. And those election forms not only state what benefit they're qual qualifying for, it says the length or duration of those payments. And that is in, for example, in the election form for the payment of monthly vacation accruals, it states the city's name, or I'm sorry, the um, employee's name, request to be paid vacation accruals beginning on a specific date for a period of 48 months. It says the same thing in the sick leave accruals for a period of three consecutive years. And that's another evidence of the city's intent not to terminate this benefit when the MOA terminated. It didn't. The city intended, and you have to look at what its intent was, not just on July 1st, 2012, when it entered into this contract, but also how it has administered this contract over the course of decades. And I mean decades, because these, these provisions have been in these MOAs for decades. It's also evident in the manner in which the city uh, requires each one of these plaintiffs to meet very, very high levels of uh, say let's say saving their vacation and sick leave in order to qualify this is not something that can happen in a two-year period if you want to save enough vacation to be able to qualify to elect into this you have to not take vacation for 14 and a half years the parties negotiated these specific terms in order to have individuals who not only had 17 years credited service in PSPRS, they also had to have 10 years service with the city of Phoenix, and they had to have the various number of accruals before they could even elect into this. And on top of that... So I, what I'm hearing is that there are a lot of qualifications. So it's a very high bar to turn on the water at the faucet. It is a very high bar, Your Honor. Okay, but what if there's no water to come out of the faucet? But, Your Honor, at the time they elected in, by the, when they qualified and met these qualifications, their rights to payment became vested. And I think that's... How, how did, walk me through this. What, how does that vest? Because, I mean, it's, is it backward looking? Had they already accrued that? The, these individuals all met the, the various required accrual rates at some point when the valid 2012, 2014. Right, was but we're in talking effect. about conversion of, of very specific numbers. And so and, and it's so they qualify to do this. Um, but when does that happen? And because this is important, right? Because if it uh, if, if it's cashed out in, in lump sum, uh, at any particular point and how it gets how it gets accounted for that's really kind of the nut right so and what what about this makes it vested well I I don't believe that these are benefits that can be cashed out whatsoever because the way that these provisions are written and the way they're administered by the city is that once you meet the high bar in order to even be able to qualify for these benefits, then you have to notify the city, I want to take advantage, and the city's vehicle for them to notify the city is by the required written election forms. The city's fiscal, um, I, I think her name was Jill Salaya, I could be wrong, but it's in our briefs. She under oath in her affidavit stated that once an employee reaches the very high qualifications and actually wants to take advantage of these benefits, they must fill out one of these written election forms. They must turn it into the city specifically fiscal management. Yeah, but and at what, that time but, they start. But what gets converted? This is, is a it, negotiated is it future, benefit. If it's, is it future time? No. Or is it time that's already... No, this was negotiated to be paid as wages, pensionable compensation. And that was one of the early, early on in this case... The what, what specifically is, is negotiated to be paid as wages? Future time? The f future accruals of time will not... So, so, for example, if I'm a city employee, under my contract, I get, let's say, eight hours of sick time a year. I don't use it, so that continues. Once they elect into this so that they can now be paid pensionable wages, they no longer accrue any sick leave or any vacation leave if, if they opted into both of those. Those stop, and the parties negotiated that instead 
these individuals would be paid pensionable compensation for a period of, at a minimum, three years. All of the provisions say three years. Added and to their paycheck. I'm sorry? Added to their paycheck. Correct. So yes, instead of wages. getting vacation, instead of getting sick time, they get a bump in their paycheck. They get wages. Okay. And I believe under Arizona... Going forward. Going forward. Okay. And I believe it, but, it, it's our... But how, how would it be pensionable wages if the statute for PSPRS says it can't be pensionable wages. It, it doesn't qualify as compensation. Uh, I, I disagree with that, too, because that was the fight that we had with the Goldwater Institute very early on. And Judge Oberbillig, after hearing all of the briefing and the arguments, made a ruling that the manner in which these payments are paid by the City of Phoenix is pensionable compensation. It meets the definition of salary within the PSPRS statutes under 38842. Uh, so this is 42 specifically excludes any kind of fringe benefits but, or payouts for sick leave. I mean, there's language specifically that's been in the statute since well before 1988. That's right. Payout, payout for accrued sick leave. But this is not a payout for your accrued sick leave. This is a negotiated. At one time, we called these exchanges, but everybody settled on wage enhancement benefits. These are. So it converts to salary. Is it that what it you're is saying? yes, it is a salary. Yes. Going and forward again. Going forward. So they well, make the, they, from the they qualify, they make the election, and then in, and this is how Judge Oberbilly viewed it, right? They qualify, they make the exception, and then they no longer accrue these things. Instead, they get bumps to their wages for a specific period of time going forward. Correct. Okay. Correct. And I have left my counsel no time for rebuttal, so I apologize. Thank you. Mr. Heskett? Good morning. My name is Matt Hesketh. With me are John Doran and Carly Simpkin. We're from the law firm of Sherman Howard. We're here on behalf of the city of Phoenix. Also in attendance is Polly Rapp from the city attorney's office. I want to pick up just very quickly on some of the issues that uh, Ms. Pilch was just talking about, the vested issue. Uh, plaintiffs argue that they vested in multiple ways. They first argue that they vested by meeting the election criteria, the eligibility criteria. And then they also uh, argue that they, they vested by making an election. The, meeting the eligibility criteria did not give them a vested benefit, and that is law of the case now. In response to the city's second motion for judgment on the pleadings, the Superior Court said, unless you have elected in and are actively participating, your claims are barred. That ruling has not been appealed. That necessarily means you did not have a vested right simply by meeting the election criteria. And as the court uh, noted, this is a going forward program. It is pay for services as rendered. The pay comes in contemporaneously with the services as they are rendered on a going forward basis. It is not deferred compensation. That's an undisputed fact. It does not look backward. It's not pay for something that accrued previously, for something that was earned previously. And it can't be because then it wouldn't be pensionable compensation. The only way that this possible work possibly works and is pensionable compensation if it's pay, contemporaneous pay, paid out regularly for services as they are rendered on a going forward basis. There's no retrospective, retroactive aspect of this. The election uh, also did not provide a vested benefit and that's the holding this court's holding in Paxosa. Paxosa was nearly the same situation, had a three-year election and a one-year contract. This court said- Council, pa I'm sorry, go ahead. Isn't Paxosa a little bit different here? Because Paxosa was a yearly employment contract. My understanding is, is that these contracts are about benefits. They're not employment contracts. For instance, if it expires, the police officers are not losing their jobs. Um, their their employment is not being terminated. It's just about the benefits. So can you explain how Paxosa is exactly on point? Because we have a very different employment model here. That's true, Your Honor. The employment the, those were employment contracts. They weren't just about wages and benefits. However, the employer in that case did offer new employment contracts. It wasn't like the employer was simply not offering employment for the after the end of the contract period. It offered new employment just with a changed benefit package. But my point is, is aren't we talking about something totally different? Because we're talking about an employment.
employment contract where when the time runs up, you're no longer employed. Here, that's not the case. You are employed. So if there are you know, provisions that extend um, past the contract, it, it, it could be viewed as a benefit that should continue for the employee as they're continuing their employment. So two parts to that question. The first is I still believe that Paxosa is directly applicable. It's nearly the same situation because in that case, the employer was still offering continued employment. To the extent that there was a discussion about the employer had the ability to terminate their employment at the end of the contract, I believe that was dicta because that's not what the employer was doing. The employer was offering continued employment after the termination of the agreement. It was simply changing the benefit package. And the question was, does the three-year election mean that they have a continuing right post expiration of the contract? And the court said no. You had a term limited contract. The benefit package was only good for the term of that contract. The election form does not change that, does not give you a vested right. When does something become a vested right? When it is earned by services rendered. And so wage enhancement was earned by services rendered on a going forward basis. The election did not give plaintiffs a vested right. So Even we, so, we never vest. Then. It vests when they provide services, so they earn the pay. It's just like ordinary wages. Plaintiffs routinely equate this with ordinary wages in their briefing. It's just like ordinary wages. You work a day, you get a day's pay. That might not come that day, but you have a vested right to receive that pay when your normal paycheck comes. That's when it's earned. That's when it's vested. So your argument, just so I'm clear, is that the the payment is vested after the end of this contract because it was converted to wages, not because it was earned previously. Because we've talked about all the benefits that had to be earned before you could elect into this provision. Is that correct? The There was not a vested right to continue wage enhancement post-expiration, and I might have missed your question. But if services were rendered during the term of the contract while wage enhancement was still in effect, then there was a vested right to receive the wage enhancement pay correlating with those services rendered during the term of the contract. Once the contract expired, there was no ongoing right to wage enhancement. But, but this, this was an option for the employee that, that they, they could enter this program. Isn't that part? Isn't that part of their competition? That they have a right to enter into the program. So, isn't it vested in that sense? They have an option to enter into the program if they meet the eligibility criteria. But meeting. And, uh, and, and so, uh, but that's because they're employed, right? It is, it is, it's because they're employed, it's also because the contracts provided for wage enhancement during the term of the contract. Even if plaintiffs had a vested right to wage enhancement, either by meeting the eligibility criteria or making an election, and they didn't, but even if they did, that simply begs the question, a vested right to what? And the answer to that question is whatever the contract provided for. And so all of those vesting arguments simply collapse back down into what did the contract say? And I, I want to pivot. I think this gets to your question that you asked earlier. Um, the, the contracts, plaintiff's interpretation of the contracts is not reasonable and it is not lawful. First, it directly conflicts with the expiration clause. We have ex express expiration clauses within an express in end date. We understand that, but let's, let's move on to intent. So the uh, council opened with the intent of, of the parties. And I got to say, when, when you have a provision in there for decades, right, decades, then why is it not reasonable to rely that that, that that provision that's been there for decades is going to be there throughout uh, an offered uh, period for election? 
because it conflicts with the concept of collective bargaining. You have term limited agreements, you have a collective bargaining process, you negotiate in regular intervals. During those regular negotiations, those intervals of negotiation, every term is a mandatory subject of bargaining. That means every term is subject to negotiation, every term is subject to change or elimination. Those are undisputed facts. Plea and PPSLA's 30B6 representatives each confirmed all of that. The rule for extending a benefit beyond expiration, and this is what Tackett and Reese said, this is the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court's point in Tackett and Reese, in order to have a vested right that survives contract expiration, the contract itself must, must expressly say that the provision survives. And we cited federal appellate courts interpreting those two cases, and they developed a bright line rule. In order for the provision to survive, it must expressly say either that it survives using that language, this contract or this provision survives beyond the expiration, or this provision is not subject to the expiration clause. So reasonable expectations is is irrelevant. It, no, that is that is the reasonable. That's the only permissible interpretation because the parties understood that this was a term limited contract. They understood that they would be negotiating at the end of this contract. They understood that every term was a mandatory subject of bargaining. It is an admitted fact. But but that's that that's an argument that assumes the consequent. So in other words, you you can't have a reasonable expectations argument because you knew that this this particular contract had an end date, a specific end date. Is that your is that your position? It's two pieces, Your Honor. Yes, it's that because of the way the city's collective bargaining process works, the restrictions under the city charter and the city code, the parties knew that they could not agree that any provision would survive beyond contract uh, expiration. But then why is there even a mention of six years? I mean, the contract was clearly not longer than six years. so. I, I think that's the struggle that I have, is why did the contract even mention six years if your position is is you couldn't agree to anything more than two? And and, and let me add to yeah. that the, the must continue, because this was a central focus of your uh, your colleague's argument. It, it, why did it mention six years and that it must continue the for parties, at least three? I'm sorry. The parties probably anticipated, they may have even expected that wage enhancement would continue, would be in the next contract, that it would continue to be offered in the next contracts. But that anticipation, that expectation is not a guarantee. It is not a contractual agreement that it will be in the next contract. And this gets back to the point, the, the language that you need to include in order to have a vested right that survives contract. And, and I understand that, Council, but you're not answering the question. Why put six years in the contract if it's only two years? I can't, there's, I don't have, I'm not sure there's anything in the record that explains the six year. The three year is probably likely because as plaintiff's counsel mentioned, you have a high three. But it wasn't a right, a guarantee that you would be entitled to continue participating post-contract expiration. That conflicts with the expiration clause. It also conflicts with the durational clause, which says the provisions of this CBA, without exception, are binding on the parties for the term thereof. We cite a case on the briefing that interpreted nearly identical language and said that unambiguously means as a matter of law that the provisions do not survive beyond the expiration of the contracts. It's the, the Paps, the Barton, the Watkins case that we cited in the briefing. Getting back to the party's expectation that it might be around in the next contract, the UAW case that we cited in the briefing specifically addressed this. In, this, in that case, the provision said, notwithstanding future negotiations, the, these benefits will continue to be provided and certain aspects of those benefits didn't even go into effect until post-contract expiration. In that case, the court still held that is not enough to vest benefits beyond expiration because it doesn't include that language that I mentioned. It needs to include that specific language. And that was a specific holding in Cooper and UAW. Okay, but is, is that binding on us? Do we have to follow that precedent? You don't need, it, it is not binding, Your Honor, but I believe it's consistent with Paxosa, it's consistent with Gilmore, it's consistent with the city's collective bargaining process. 
it also is the only way to read these provisions the only way to permissibly read them and give them a lawful interpretation is to interpret it as a retrospective backward linking so the parties may have anticipated that the the contract the next contract would include wage enhancement but until they got there and actually made that agreement they could not bind future negotiations they could not agree that it would go forward into the next contract once they got there though they could agree to link backwards so once you elect in under a previous contract we can say under this contract you can continue your election period for the three years and you're not allowed to opt in and out you must continue the election period for the full three years into this contract but it wasn't until they got to those contractual obligations each iteration that they could actually make that agreement well, it, it sounds like the employee signs the forms on hope. I hope this continues, and I, I've, it, it seems an awfully slim benefit if it relies on hope that future negotiations work out. Plaintiffs may have hoped that it would be in the next contract, but that hope, that unilateral expectation does not give rise to a contractual right that can bind the city. I agree with that, and, and, and this is why I want to make sure that we're nailing down council's argument about it must continue for three full consecutive periods, uh, or a full three-year consecutive period. Uh, what you're saying then it, to my prior analogy is that the only thing the must is is that the must is that the employee gets their hand on the spigot of, of the hose but if there's no water in the hose we don't guarantee water in the hose we just guarantee that as long as there's water in the hose you're allowed to turn it on there is a right until the contract in effect expires after that there is no right so after the contract expires there's no guarantee that there's water now, once we get to the next contract, what about if there is water? Then the then the the benefit carries forward, doesn't it? We can. That's if we get to the next contract or and agree no. that wage enhancement will be in the next contract, then we can say we'll allow you to carry on the benefit from the past one. You can so, link backwards. You can't. The parties could not permissibly go forward. So the must refers to the availability pending renegotiation. Correct, okay. yes. That is the only way to square these provisions with the rest of the, uh, the, as council mentioned, you must take a holistic view of the entire contract. Plaintiffs fail to do that. They fail to account for the expiration clause, the durational language. They also fail to account for the integration clause. If each contract is fully integrated, is the full and complete statement of the party's agreements regarding the terms and conditions of employment for its duration. You, by definition, cannot have separate contracts, separate provisions that continue on from past contracts that run collateral to the agreement in effect. Otherwise, it wouldn't be fully integrated. So, and, and this goes kind of to what you're saying, but just to be clear, the city could, if it so chose, grant a benefit under the contracts that would extend beyond the contract period. They just had to be absolutely explicit about it. In general, if this wasn't the city with the city's limitations under its governing laws, yes, you would need to say that expressly, especially when you have all of these other provisions that you need to account for. You would need to explain how to resolve the conflict. And the rule from Tackett and Reese, the rule that the federal appellate courts developed in light of those, is that the durational clauses trump other clauses unless those clauses expressly say otherwise. And, and I think I understand where you're going with this. And, and your hedging, I think, refers to the, the three-year requirement for the city to renegotiate, right? But before you get to that, because that's in your briefing, uh, is, is there anything in the city's charter um, that says that pension spiking is, is illegal, that you can't do that? Is there anything that prohibits that? Not pension spiking, but it would prohibit allowing any provision to continue on post-contract expiration on a continuing basis for ongoing services. 
And there are four reasons. There are four reasons under the city's governing laws why that would not be permissible. First, it would interfere with the council's and manager's authority to determine compensation and make changes. The only exception is when you have terms and conditions that are set forth in a CBA that does not exceed three years. There is nothing in the charter or code that say individual provisions can continue on and bind the council and manager. It also would conflict with the requirement under the city code that each contract is fully integrated. As you mentioned, it would conflict with the three-year limitation. Under plaintiff's interpretation, you have the wage enhancement provisions that run for the two-year term of the contract. If you have an employee who elected in near the end of the contract term, and that's not theoretical, we have plaintiffs who actually did that. According to plaintiffs, they would have a three-year election period and then a second three-year election period. That is an eight-year contractual right in a contract that cannot exceed three years. There is no way to square that interpretation with the city's governing laws. Plaintiffs argue, well, it's okay because the contract itself doesn't exceed three years. That would completely defeat the purpose of the three-year limitation. It would allow the parties to fill the MOU with provisions that continue on apparently indefinitely in successive three-year increments and, and then bind the council unlawfully going forward. And this is why it doesn't matter whether or not there was reasonable ex expectations or factual questions about intent of the contract because in any event it would be illegal. Yes, Your Honor. We believe there is only one reasonable interpretation that harmonizes all of the provisions and is that retrospective backward looking interpretation that I discussed. That is the only reasonable interpretation. But even if there were questions about that, it doesn't matter because plaintiff's interpretation is unlawful. The final reason it's unlawful, it violates or it conflicts with the concept of mandatory subjects of bargaining. And this court has held, we cited it in the briefing, refusals to negotiate mandatory subjects of bargaining run afoul of collective bargaining requirements. You can't refuse to negotiate. Every term was a mandatory subject of bargaining. It means it was subject to negotiation by definition. We cited cases, federal appellate cases in the briefing that said the concept of a mandatory subject of bargaining is completely inconsistent with the idea of a vested right that continues beyond contract expiration. This is the Barton and Pacheco cases. I see that I'm out of time. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, counsel. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Mr. Wilson, you have 30 seconds. Uh, I assume you would like to use them. So, and, and before you step up, I'm most interested in response to Tackett and Barton and Pacheco. The, the Tackett case doesn't, the Tackett case and the lower court did not account for what Leighton says. The Tackett case, it doesn't require us to be so specific about the durational clause, or excuse me, the expiration. Rather, Leighton tells us that obligations already fixed under the contract, but yet satisfied, can still, uh, can still outlast the, dur the expiration of a contract. That's exactly what this is. Three years means three years. It's more than two. <laughs> there, there was no explanation or intent or, or evidence given to you to provide why or how that squares with the, the code and the charter. I'm out of time. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do you want more? I, I did ask you to address Pacheco, so if you would go there. I, I'm, I'm trying, to, uh, I'm trying to recall what Pacheco uh, held. It's, that's okay. Uh, and, and please uh, just refer to our briefs. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Council, thank you for your presentation today. We appreciate your brief briefing. We'll take this matter under advisement and, and issue a written decision in due course. Uh, we will be staying on the bench um, while we wait for the next uh, argument, um, but court is adjourned as to this matter.